start this off with a discussion around taxonomy, which is often a challenge for invertebrate collections. And I'll talk about the two sources that we have and do some comparison of their features. And then Anna's going to talk about her use of projects, publications, and agents with invertebrate collections. And then if we have time, we'll come and do a real quick overview of media and geolocation. Um, but those have already been covered by other webinars. So if we don't get that far, we will have covered, I think, the important things. Just very briefly, um, our collection at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is around 45,000 lots with 30,000 in Arctos. And it's mostly mollusca, but it does include marine, freshwater, and terrestrial, despite its name. Um, around 60% are geolocated and 1,000 or so have images. And all of our databasing is done by volunteers and an intern. So I'm going to focus today on single record data entry, even though we do a small amount of bulk loading, um, and how we use some of the features of Arctos to make that go more smoothly. And we also tend to geolocate during data entry, and we do our images not as a bulk load, but instead as a drag and drop. We've been in Arctos for about seven years, and a year and a half ago, we moved our taxonomy source from Arctos to worms via Arctos, and it has been wonderful. We are very, very pleased. So um, we'll jump into why we think that and how that works. This is the way I like to look at the Arctos taxonomic structure. Um, there is a huge bag of all of the taxon names that have ever been entered into Arctos, and it's well over a million names. And we share all of those. Um, taxonomy is both shared and a controlled feature of Arctos. But when you pull a taxon name out, the classification, the metadata, all of that is determined by the source that you've chosen. And there are three sources, one called Arctos, which is really everything but that is not in Arctos plants, and then worms via, Arctro, via Arctos. Um, so let's take a look at each of the two that would apply to invertebrate taxonomy. The Arctos source um, is everything that has been created and managed by the users as a community resource. So we have a lot of taxon names that came from outside sources, but also everything that's been uploaded with Arctos collections. And the quality of data, of course, varies a huge amount depending upon the original source and how much it's been updated. And many of our users spend a significant amount of time working on updating the taxonomy, which as we all know, is, seems to be constantly changing. Um, it may contain misspellings, and I will say that probably our collection has added a few of those as well. And there are some inconsistencies in higher classification. Uh, when we started to use Arctos, we found that we sometimes had the same species in two different families because of the timing when they were added, what was considered to be valid taxonomy. Um, and then in addition to that, we, we received a large donation that was quite a broad uh, group of molluscan specimens. And we found we were having to add taxa every day and sometimes every hour. Um, so it was quite incomplete for what we were looking at. So about a year and a half ago, Arctos entered into a partnership with the World Register of Marine Species, which we know as worms. Um, and is, it is a controlled taxonomy that is vetted by a group of global editors. And it is our first externally managed source that we have in Arctos, but I don't think it will be our last. Uh, and it's been a very, very good one to work with at the first time. Worms via Arctos is continuously updated by what we call a taxon APIA ID, and I'm going to show all of this to you in a second here. And it gets all of its data from a variety of specialized databases. And since we are mostly molluscan, we're interested in what feeds it, uh, the molluscan taxonomy, which is a website called Mollusca Base. And Mollusca Base is broader than just marine. It also has terrestrial and fossil species in it. And we'll look at that as well. Now, every once in a while, we find that a taxon is not in worms yet, and we can add missing taxa. We try to do that in the best way possible so we don't corrupt the database. So a year and a half ago, when we went to worms, here's what's happened. Um, immediately, the number of taxon names and classifications we had to add dropped by at least 90%. 
and it continues to decline as more and more taxon names and classifications come into worms. Our higher classification immediately became consistent for all the species in the same genus, which um, we now don't have to worry about spending any time using what's called the hierarchical tool to try to uh, get consistency in that area. And then lastly, everything that is in the worms database, which is at marinespecies.org, became available within Arctos itself. And I think this is an advantage to anyone, regardless of whether they use the worms via Arctos taxonomy source. And I'll be showing that to you too. Now there were a few surprises, and I would uh, make certain that you're aware of these. First of all, genera can be moved to a new family, I'm gonna say without warning. Um, I by no means can read every uh, piece of literature that comes out about changes in invertebrate taxonomy. And the reason why this impacts us is that we organize our collection by family. And as a result, when a species is moved to a different family, um, we try, since we're still fairly small, to relabel and actually move those into that other family or add the family or take away a family, whatever is required. Now, other collections, and Anna's is one, um, are organized by location or they're barcoded, which Arctos supports. And if that's the case, then this change really doesn't have as much impact on you. So far, this has not been a huge problem for us, but it's something to be aware of. Secondly, species names can become modified and the taxa that you put in as valid suddenly becomes invalid. Fortunately, there's a very easy way to search for these and correct them in Arctos, and I'll show you where a tutorial is that describes that. Um, but we have quite a few hundred right now that we're working on from this past year. Um, the data entry process, it does not limit the name you can put in to those that are in your source or to those that are valid. So you still have to confirm that the taxon name you're going to use is a good one. Fortunately, there's a way to do that within Arctos, um, as well as to look at worms or some other source that you consider to be your best authority. And then the last one, as I mentioned, is that uh, terrestrial and freshwater species aren't as strong in worms. They are being added on a regular basis, um, but until then we have to individually add those. So I wanna first of all point out a couple of resources. This is from the page of our tutorial blitz on your taxonomy. Um, the first two are how to add identifications. The third one is how to use the search taxonomy function. This is actually a very powerful uh, function that can bring up lots of information that I find very, very helpful to our collection. And then the next two, one is the short version and the other is a longer version on how to find and update records that have an invalid taxon name. And this is something we do, oh, at least twice or three times a year just to make sure that we keep up with changes. The other resources that are helpful are in the handbook. Under taxonomy, you'll see we have seven different uh, ones here. And the last one on how to create and taxa in externally managed sources was just added in order to deal with worms via Arctos as our only externally managed source. And if you do elect to use worms, I would recommend that you uh, look at this and of course make any comment if you have any other ideas on how to approach that. I mentioned Molluska Base as being a source of a lot of the data that flows into worms and therefore into our, um, into our taxonomy. And this is its website. It tends to think of itself as all mollusca with worms being focused on marine. And they imply that worms doesn't include everything. So far in my experience, I find everything from mollusca base in worms. But if you have a malacological collection, you might want to monitor that. Um, I think mollusca base certainly could be a secondary in, um, externally managed source for Arctos if needed. So let's take a look at how things look in worms and then how they look in Arctos. And I chose this species, Fargoa bushiana. Um, it's a marine species, and this is the worm's taxonomic record. And I mentioned the Appia ID. This number controls, um, it's, it's unique to this species, and that's how we bring the data over into Arctos. As you can see, it's called accepted here, 
in worms, we change that to valid. Uh, if it's not accepted, we use the term invalid, but that way we know the taxon status. And then there's a, a fair amount of additional information, the author and so forth. If we go to a taxonomy screen, and this is found simply by doing a search, come to the very top here, here's Fargoa bushiana in Arctos now. And the first thing it shows is who's using it. Our collection has two uh, specimen records that use this as an identification. It shows where it's been geolocated and it shows its image as well. And then it gives synonyms for that in addition. Two of them are from worms, one from itis. The important thing here in classifications, the only two that are local are Arctos and worms via Arctos. Those can be edited and those can be a source. So let's look first at the Arctos one. It came in from Idis in 2007, has a classification. It's missing an author, but it does show a valid uh, status for the taxon. If we skip down to worms, we see again the Appia ID and the author, as well as a somewhat more extensive classification. By the way, I can also refresh here if I am not certain that this is the most uh, recent information. And this went directly to worms and refresh this. I also can just click on the arrow and I can find myself back at worms looking at the actual record. So that's a big help too. So I mentioned that in data entry, your uh, taxon name is not limited. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna assume that I picked up an old shell that we're gonna database and it's saying that it's a Fargoa dux. Just, oops, sorry. I have to spell that correctly. And if I tab, it's going to go and it's going to take a look in that huge grab bag. And it turns that field green and it tells me that that is a taxon that has its name in Arctos. But it tells me nothing about whether or not that's a valid name um, or not. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to just put in the genus. And that's going to bring up all of these details here for all the names that are in Fargoa. And if I, this isn't showing me the way I want it to show. So hang on for a minute here, guys. Okay. All right. Now let's do this again. Okay. Okay, this is the way it, it will be looking next week after we make the conversion. And as you can see, here's Fargoa Dux, and it has details that I can look at, but it shows a valid status in Arctos. What it doesn't show is what it is in worms. The next one down and a number of these others show that they are valid in worms. So if I were to go to this, I would see that this has a number of different sources, one being Arctos. It came from Idis in 2007 and it says it's valid, but there's no worms. And if I had gone ahead and left this in, I would have had no higher classification. I would have had um, inability for someone to search on the family and find my specimen. So needless to say, I don't want to use this as it is. There is a hint here um, if I go down to GBIF, GBIF has actually modified it to what it considers to be the synonym, chrysalidodux. So, and I'm going to just briefly show you, this is the actual GBIF record on that. So I, have, I need to do a little bit more research is what I'm finding in order to be able to know for sure what this should be. And there are a number of ways to go about it. I could do an advanced search in worms, but I wanna show you that right within Arctos, if I do a search for just the species name, and I'm pre uh, prefacing that with a pr uh, percent sign in order for it to be a contains, but I think I'd get several hundred if I just typed it in. So, um, so I'm going to limit it to the family of Pyramidellidae. And when I do that, I get three records. And again, I'm gonna look at our metadata. 
Um, I have one that is valid in both worms and arctos. I have our Vargoa dux that we looked at earlier that has only got an arctos record. And then I have one that is valid in arctos and one that is invalid in worms. Needless to say, we probably need to do a little updating on this. But what I have here is a pretty good hint since um, GBIF has already given me an indication that it thinks that that is the valid one, that this is probably the better one for me to choose. And again, I might want to do a refresh just to make certain there hasn't been any changes. And if so, I would probably go ahead and use this um, in my data entry screen here. And again, when I put that in, it's going to go and it's going to accept that as well. Now, so this is the way I can do it when we're doing a single entry. Um, this was a fairly easy one. Sometimes you have to do a lot more searching. If I am working on this instead to do it as a bulk load, I would go through the scientific name checker tool to make sure the names are in our bag of taxon names. And then I would move over and I would go through the taxon name. This is the, um, this is all under data services and it's the last two, the taxon name validator here. And if I were to look at all of the um, Vargoa to see what I have, this would be what I would get. Um, it's not the easiest thing to read, but as you can see, I would see that it was found in worms, others were not found. So this would pretty quickly tell me whether or not I need to do more research um, or whether or not I'm in a good position. So all the data that is out there in a, a major uh, resource for most invertebrate collections is now built into Arctos. Um, so it's very easy for us to find out more and more about taxonomy. I'm going to turn my screen over now to Anna, who's going to talk, and then we'll come back and see if we have additional questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Phyllis. Let me just share my screen here. Can you guys see this okay? Looks good. Awesome. Yep. All right. So today we're going to do a little show and tell on how uh, we've used a few different Arctos collection management tools to handle our invertebrates collections data. Um, starting with the Arctos project module and then kind of going into how the project's module integrates with other features uh, like loans and accessions. Um, all of these bits of Arctos infrastructure, um, as Phyllis said, have webinars associated with them. Um, so if you're interested in a particular topic, I would really encourage you to follow up with the uh, Arctos YouTube channel or on the Arctos website. Um, to give a little context for these examples, um, our non-arthropod invertebrates collection is primarily a malacology collection, um, and it's relatively small, um, only about 15,000 lots uh, of both freshwater and marine mollusks. Um, we've started using the projects module to track our institutional activities, uh, so that we can better demonstrate the research significance of our collections. Um, for us, this is especially vital uh, just as a small collection. Um, the last time we had a malacologist on staff was about 10 years ago. Um, and even when we had a curator, we have mainly been a lending institution um, and haven't maintained any active in-house malacology research in quite some time. Um, so because of this, it's really important that we be able to show the scientific value of our collections, um, even when it may not be uh, immediately evident to our institution's administration. Um, so the Arctos Projects page is a really flexible tool that can uh, allow us to collate and display um, otherwise really discrete information from all over Arctos, include, including specimen records, um, collection related media publications on one coherent public page that we can then share with our colleagues and granting agencies, um, museum administrators, uh, all as metrics or to credit project participants and contributors. Uh, so this first project use case that I wanted to showcase today uh, is using the projects module to document uh, historic research projects. So I've brought up here um, a project uh, that was an ecological survey uh, done in the Chicagoland area in uh, 1908 uh, by a malacologist named Frank Baker. Um, so this is kind of the basic layout here. We've gathered all sorts of information um, all about this particular ecological survey. He went out and collected all sorts of freshwater mollusks um, in this area called Skokie Marsh, um, today Skokie Lagoons. Uh, so we have a little description, um, 
as well as the publication um, that he put out uh, after the completion of the survey. Um, and then we also have listed all the specimens that he collected uh, for the Academy uh, during the survey itself. Um, and when we scroll down, you can see he also um, photographed a lot of his research sites. And we also have the glass plate negative uh, uh, images in our collection as well. So this one page, you can see it, it really agglomerates all sorts of different kinds of information. Um, and this page uh, is entirely viewable to the public. Um, so if I were to share the URL for this project page, anyone using this URL, regardless of if they're an Arctos operator, um, can see exactly what I'm seeing right now, which is super valuable um, for all sorts of interdisciplinary um, collections management, uh, as well as just for um, data uh, discovery. So, I mean, for example, if we had a malacologist come to us and ask us about the specimens collected during the survey, um, they might not even realize that we have uh, all of this potentially rich environmental data uh, captured in this photography here. Um, so we can direct them to this page and um, they might be able to discover more um, information than they ever thought uh, existed about this survey. So we'll go back up to the top of the page and we can kind of take a look at uh, the behind the scenes of this project. Um, I'll hit edit project. I can only do this um, when I'm logged in as an Arctos operator. Otherwise, I only see the public facing page. So here we have all sorts of editable fields. Um, we can really format the description nicely using uh, Markdown, um, but you don't have to. We also have all sorts of different kinds of roles that uh, different agents, including people and uh, institutions can play uh, in relation to a project. Um, all of our agents are also stored in a separate table that's shared uh, between our in institutions. Um, and then down here we can see that specimens are related to projects uh, through two different um, transaction types, either accessions or loans. So in this particular project, we've been able to identify a few different accessions um, that contributed specimens to this project. Um, and if in your research you realize uh, you know, I've discovered a new accession that actually belongs in this project. Um, adding new accessions um, is really easy because uh, projects are such a dynamic um, space. So I'll hit add accession and you can either uh, use all sorts of different query um, variables, but I know the accession number that I want to add. And I'll come down here, find accession. And then adding, relating the, the accession to the project is as easy as clicking add accession. And then this in turn relates all the specimens um, that are related to the accession to the project itself, itself as well. Um, so now we have five accessions related to the project. Um, I think we have a little bit of time too, so I'll, I'll just go into media um, a little bit now and maybe we can expand on it later um, if we have any more time. But, I'll open up this media detail page right here. You can see that this photograph uh, is not only associated with um, the Baker Ecological Survey, but it's also associated with the collecting event. Um, and collecting events in Arctos represent a uh, point in time um, and space, uh, so uh, a time that specimens were collected. And if I were to click through on this collecting event, we could view all of the specimens that were collected um, at the exact same site that's pictured um, in this image. So you kind of get an idea of how establishing projects and relationships within the Arctos ecosystem um, can really uh, reveal a lot of information that otherwise would just remain hidden um, and behind the scenes if all of this information were kept in kind of dis discrete little uh, spaces, either online or on your uh, hard drives on the computer. So heading back to my project, I'll scroll all the way back up and go back to the detail page. And some of you may have noticed that this particular section um, agglomerates projects using specimens that were contributed by the Skokie uh, Marsh project. So any projects that we've set up that also use specimens um, from these accessions that I've related to the Skokie Marsh project uh, will show up here uh, 
as um, related projects. So this can kind of give you an, an idea of the impact that your project uh, has on, um, on other related projects. So it kind of gives you an idea of the ripple effect uh, of your collection. So I'll click into my second project here. And this is a kind of a different use case as well. Um, this project is set up to document um, uh, our partner to existing network grant that uh, we worked on uh, from 2016 to 2019 um, as part of the Invert eBase TCN. And we have a whole bunch of folks who contributed to this project. Of course, I mean, when you're setting up projects, it's your prerogative um, as a collection manager who to include on the public pages. But I like to include everybody just um, as to give credit to everyone who contributed labor to the project itself. Um, especially, I think this is valuable for folks like undergraduate students um, who might uh, want an actual tangible product to share with potential future employers or graduate schools. I can send them this URL um, and then they can forward that on to um, anyone who might be interested. Um, and it's really great. Um, kind of take home for anyone who contributed uh, to making our data, um, to making our data better uh, through this one uh, grant period. So scrolling down, we again have a little description. Here's where the funding information, um, if it's available, will be displayed. We can see all the specimens used in the project, um, or at least the ones that uh, we've collected um, in one place uh, through transactions. And um, we'll take a look at that on the back end as well. And then we have our type specimen images um, that were uh, related to specimens um, during the project period. So scrolling back up, I'll go into edit project. And you can see here we've got our funding, uh, project agents, and I've kind of expanded on just the um, more generic agent roles. Um, these are all code table controlled, so uh, if you have need for a new kind of agent role, um, you can always, as an ArcDOS member, you can request uh, new roles for uh, project agents, but um, for now, uh, just adding in some more detail in the remarks is fine for me. Um, and then in this project, um, we've related specimens via loans as opposed to through um, accessions. So, and I think that th these two loans actually represent um, really good examples of the different kinds of loans that you could possibly relate to projects and show the flexibility of um, uh, the loan infrastructure on Arctos as well. So I'll open up my first loan here. And this is a more typical uh, specimen loan. We lent our malacology type specimens to the field museum so that one of their technicians could image them for us. Um, so this is called a returnable loan. Um, it's really easy to add loans to projects. So if I had another project that I wanted to add this loan to, um, I could just type in some keywords. Hit tab, and Arctos will automatically uh, bring up all the projects with uh, these keywords um, in titles and descriptions and agents. Then, if I navigate back to my project, this second type of loan is what we call a data loan. And so, this is distinct from our actual returnable specimen loans in that um, what we're really interested in is um, agglomerating the data for these specimens. So this loan represents um, all of the specimens that were geo-referenced as part of our Invert eBase uh, pen grant. Um, so I actually have this, the specimens loaded up. Um, if I wanted to generate a list of the specimens that were included in this loan, I would just click the specimens button down here at the bottom of the page. Um, but there are 20,000, so I just have them loaded up here. This is what would be returned if I clicked that button. Um, so it's a really, it's, I think it's a really great tool, um, data loans that is, uh, because it allows us to keep track of um, 
long processes like georeferencing um, and allows us to access all of the information um, in one place. So it, I don't know, it, the loan system is, uh, is really flexible and can be used for all sorts of um, processes and documenting um, labor, for example. So I'll go back to the project. And um, oh yeah, uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention while we're on the um, topic of Invert eBase, uh, I'll go back up to the detail page so we can kind of do like a compare and contrast. Um, I also have our Invert eBase um, Symbiota portal up here. And there is some information about our um, collection uh, just listed on the portal itself. But um, I think for our purposes, this Arctos project does a really good job of fleshing out um, all of the unique parts of uh, our pen grant that wouldn't necessarily be captured um, just by the Symbiota portal. Um, and so just adding on to like the richness of the information that's available out there, I think Arctos projects do a really good job um, of that. Um, what's more is that because Arctos data are published um, to the BERTNET um, integrated publishing toolkit um, on a monthly basis, once our data were in Arctos, we didn't have to do anything to actually serve this information into um, our Symbiota portals. Um, as they relate to the grant. Um, so you can see here, I, I don't know, actually, let's zoom in a little bit so you can definitely see. Um, you can see here that our IPT uh, source is the BERTNET IPT source, and this is just an automatic feature um, of Arctos. So we don't have to do any maintenance on the Symbiota end, everything is handled for us. So I think the last thing that I wanted to mention before passing it back over to Phyllis um, was uh, a little bit about how agents um, work in Arctos and how they relate to projects. So I'm here back at my first uh, project, the Ecological Survey, and I can just click into Frank Collins Baker's agent profile. Um, his wife is also in Arctos, as you can see. And so as I mentioned before, the agents page, um, or sorry, the agents table is a shared table amongst all Arctos institutions. So any Arctos institution um, can make use of Frank Collins Baker's name as well as access all of the information um, on his agent activity page. Um, so a lot of the information that we have here, um, we've input, but everyone in the Arctos network can make use of it as well. So as I scroll down, you can actually see that uh, Denver has got uh, a Baker specimen in their collection. Um, and this isn't too surprising just because uh, malacologists tend to trade a lot of material. So, um, but I don't know, I think that this is a really great demonstration of um, how interrelated uh, all of our uh, natural history collections are and how uh, a really deep connected uh, network um, of information can reveal connections that um, would otherwise be hidden. Um, you can see he's got all sorts of media related to his name, as well as publications that we've added to Arctos, um, mainly during the, the Penn Grant period. Um, here we can also head over to citations within uh, these publications, and these, um, these refer to um, cited voucher specimens um, within each of these publications, uh, which we might not as easily be, have been able to find uh, if the publications only lived in um, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, for example. Um, so that's all I have. I think Phyllis had an extra bit about agents. So I'm going to pass the mic back over to uh, Phyllis, if I can. OK. All right, is, um, here we go. Okay, is everyone looking at an agent record here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to make one more comment around the use of agents. This is um, a Cuban malacologist, Miguel um, Hame. And in his case, um, I wanted to put a little bit more information in about him. 
basically looking out to the future as well as current researchers. And I did find a URL that I've included here, but knowing that URLs change, I also did a um, screen print um, of the information and just attach that. Um, so that in case somebody is not certain they have the right person, they can take a look at this and that usually gives them some different, additional information. Um, we can look at the agent activity report for, for him and it'll indicate that we have 177 specimens. And one of the nice things is that we can then, if we want to, take a look at all the images that we've put together. And again, since this is public information, it does also show a lot of his labels. Um, and I have found other collections where I have matching labels and that's been a big help to me. So um, I wanted to make sure I had those up and attached to that agent record. Okay, um, I wanted to briefly show you how easy it is to add media to a single um, specimen record. This again is the same collector, the Gelha May, and all I really need to do is to click on attach media and I've got a media sitting over here and I drag and I drop. And um, the time frame is pretty quick to upload that. I'm going to indicate that this is our license and I'm going to go ahead and put in our number and oh, I would have to choose a big long taxon name and today's date and we create media. Um, so it's a very, very quick process. And if I just refresh my record, let's hope it works. There's my media. And it's um, very fast, very quick, and we're very, very pleased. When we came on board with Arctos, we had no media. Um, and so we've been able to, to use this feature to significantly increase our presence in that respect. Um, then I also wanted to briefly show you geolocation and how we use it again as in the single record. Uh, when we came to Arctos, we only had two um, records that had coordinates per se. Um, they had descriptions, but that was it. And so we now are able to geolocate probably 70 to 80 percent of our individual records as we put them in. And this is an example that I've created here. It's a pretty straightforward one. Some of them, when we're trying to find a reef in the middle of the ocean, can be somewhat more challenging. Um, but every day there are better resources out there for us. So we simply click on geolocate. And in this case, it takes us directly to where we want to be at this Bunch Beach Preserve. Now I'm gonna edit the uncertainty a little bit, and this is always a judgment call, but we don't know exactly where along this beach here. Um, this specimen was collected. So I'm going to give it enough uncertainty um, to, to feel comfortable that we're including all of the area. And then we simply saved our location and everything is completed. So this makes it quite easy for um, our volunteers to feel comfortable in geolocating the majority of our specimen records that we, that we bring to them. Um, that's pretty much an overview. I'd like to turn it back to you, Emily, to see if there are any questions. Thanks to you both. That was a fabulous tour of Arctos. Um, feel free, folks, if you want to either unmute to ask a question or type in the chat. Um, we'll open it up now. I didn't see any questions throughout the chat, um, but I guess I'll start us off. Um, Phyllis, I might have missed this as I was uh, letting people in from the waiting room, but did you say that um, the worms arc via Arctos taxonomy, <clears throat> is that editable or, I mean, obviously we shouldn't touch it, but <clears throat> just wondering how um, that Yeah, it is and it isn't. <laughs> um, if I take a look here at this worms resource, I can go in and I can edit the classification. The issue is that the next time that refreshes, it wipes out everything I did. So in terms of an individual record, um, it really is um, not editable because this is externally curated. And that's the way we want it to be. We, I'm not a taxonomist. We don't have a malacologist on staff. I really rely on having access 
um, to, to these people who know this information through worms. But I can add a taxon name that didn't exist um, that I feel I absolutely have to have. And I, I'm gonna show you one, it's actually kind of interesting. I was looking at it this morning. This, this one is a um, Alabastrina, it's a, a land snail found in Morocco. And about a month ago, I created this. As you can see here, it was- Do you wanna share your screen? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not gonna do much good, is it? Here we go, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, Back to where we Still were again. seeing your screen. No, right one more time. There that should do it. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so I'm looking now at a taxon record that I actually created. It shows here I created it back in July of last year. Um, and when I created it, um, I had done some research. I had found a related publication that showed that this was a valid species. And so I went ahead and I created a worms. And when I created that, in that respect, I can edit that source. Um, and when I created that, my name was down here as the uh, managed by. Um, we try to do that in anything that we add to worms so we know who's responsible to keep it up to date because there was no Appia ID. And then, <laughs> we, as you can see, we got an Appia ID. It just came in. And when I went to look for the record in worms, it only was done, it was updated um, just within the last, let's see, May of this year. So, um, so yes, you can modify by adding taxon names to worms, but you cannot overwrite their record and have that be permanent. Because the next time that this is updated through this Appia ID, um, it's, going, it's going to uh, immediately uh, overwrite anything that you do. Does that answer that, Emily? Yeah, that's great. And it's a great quality control. <laughs> well, it really is. And, and what the other thing is, is that if I add something, um, if I add a species, I always add it by cloning the genus at the genus level from within worms. And that way I know I'm going to get an identical higher classification. Um, and I always try to have a source so that anybody who comes in knows the basis on which I added it to. And those, all those things are described in the um, handbook. Great. And then we have a question from Megan King. She asks, how are the records shared with the volunteers? Um, I'm not sure I know the records. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that. Yeah, Megan, if you could clarify, um, possibly me meeting the um, volunteers who are georeferencing or working on one of your projects. Yes, georeferencing. Oh, okay. So how, do, how are we sharing that? Let me see if I can. Um, I mean, our actual, our, our um, this is this is the screen that our volunteers are using to do data entry um and we we have well i'm always there with them and we have a lot of discussion around some of these in order to make sure that we're getting to the right place but i'm not sure i'm going to answer the right question here without a little more clarification uh she clarified yes georeferencing through symbiota we use crowdsourcing oh so i think um, maybe even talk about permissions. Yeah, maybe I can jump in here too. Please. Um, so all of our volunteers who use ArcDOS each have their own uh, username. And so uh, we'll create an account uh, with them and then give them specific um, permissions. There are all sorts of hierarchical levels of permissions that um, you can give um, different folks in your, who are using your collection data. Um, all the way from you can only view um, specimens to you have ultimate control over uh, entire collection uh, metadata. Um, so for us, um, georeferencing, we've done it uh, retroactively. So we uploaded all of our spatial data um, and then um, our volunteers went through a protocol um, 
well, they were mostly undergraduate students, um, interns, went through a protocol to systematically georeference. And they were, we largely instructed them only to georeference our localities um, because we have just more information about our specific localities. But um, on Arctos, all locality uh, and geography data are shared between Arctos institutions. So if we were to plan an Arctos-wide georeferencing project, um, that would be possible. Um, Arctos users could go in and georeference uh, localities associated with uh, multiple Arctos institution um, specimens. So maybe I can go ahead and give a little more information then about our volunteers. And our volunteers range from um, undergraduates to mostly, quite honestly, most of them are retired. Um, and so, Every, every one of them, every, um, when we're doing our specimen records, most of them right now that we're working with actually have been purchased from dealers who have given us in some cases very explicit um, description of localities and in other cases even coordinates. And um, it's really a matter of training over time to, to learn a little bit more about where things are because we're talking about for the most part oceans um, and coastal areas, which can be quite challenging and in many cases are not terribly specific in the locality that we're given. But we'd like to be able to give researchers at least an indication of the general area where the specimen was found because we feel that has value. And so for the, whenever we can, if we see the same locality coming up again and again, we encourage our volunteers to use the feature and I'm going to go ahead and do another screen share here. Um, I would encourage them to use the pick event or the pick locality. Um, is that showing yet? Here we go. Not yet. Oh, there. Not yet. There we go. Okay. Uh, we use the pick locality. Um, and if I don't know, but I think if I were to go ahead and do this, um, and I'm going to go ahead and put in Florida. And then I'm going to put in our specific locality is Bunch Beach. And it's used only by us. We try to just stick with the ones that we know would be marine. And if I do the search on that. For some reason, Phyllis, I think because you're in the test server, that yeah. little pop-up window is not visible. Um, okay. Let but me, just to uh, describe it as a little query window that pops up that she's looking in. You're, you're right. That's a pop-up window. Um, and then... I can probably do it if I switch my share screen, but let me just go ahead and say, um, the pop-up window normally will come up with a number of, um, of localities, and I go through fairly frequently and try to organize those and make them function better um, so that um, we don't have ones that are just off by um, a very tiny amount, but not really being able to um, not, not really a different locality, so we try to organize those. And again, it's a matter of training. Um, it's probably something that we have more discussion about than anything else. So, um, but their authority is really only to be able to create localities through the, um, the data entry process and they don't actually go in and modify existing localities. I try to, um, there's one other departmental associate, the two of us do the modification of existing localities and only within our collection. We have not yet uh, wanted to modify any locality used by another collection. Does that help? Yeah, I think that was great. Um, that's a good segue into Erica's question actually. Um, so she was curious about what kinds of geographic resources you find useful for georeferencing marine localities, and how does Arctos manage administrative geographic information like country for marine localities that aren't super close to shore, which seems to be a plague of all marine localities. And actually, we um, I would encourage anyone who wants to to to, um, to work with the geography or the the <laughs> that group. Um, because that is an issue right now. Um, for example, when I did this geolocate um, on Bunch Beach, it actually worked out to be fine because the way the, um, the WKT is includes this area, but we frequently get annotations telling us that we have dropped our pen outside of the area 
Um, in other words, it's not on land because that's not where it was found. It was found just offshore. And there's a lot of discussion around whether or not we should be saying that this is actually in the Gulf of Mexico if it's just, let's say, just a short distance away um, from the coast or whether or not it's okay to associate it with the landmass, which is mostly what the, the tradition is for museums. Um, so right now we're looking at a number of different uh, resources. There are, there are various ones. None of them seem to have generated extreme enthusiasm um, from the users in Arctos. And I have not yet seen anyone feel as though they have found the preferred one for that. If we could, we would be delighted to have a database that we uh, just basically went to, but what we do is we get on Google, uh, for the most part, we just simply get on Google Earth. And if I, if I were searching for our Bunch Beach, Florida, I would just hope that I could, could pull up a map and go from there. Um, so I, I wish I could give you a better answer to my mind right now that is still an outstanding question and we have not yet come to closure. I try to talk to other museums about that periodically, and I find that most of them are in a similar situation. So maybe it's, it's something that needs to be addressed by the community above and beyond Arctos. Wish I could give you a better answer. Oh, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, <laughs> apologies. Uh, yeah, I was saying that I think a lot of institutions are in the same boat for that. Um, Nuno, you, I believe you're next if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, Emily, uh, Phyllis, and Anne. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. Let me see you can see me now. So greetings from Mexico. Uh, I think we are three or four of us from our research group, and I've been following uh, IDIGBIO for several years now. We are a Mexican institution, and as you know, most of the collections in Mexico are not based in museums, are based on universities, which are institutions that are not the solid uh, along the time to preserve the collections. So I'm very worried that all the effort we did with a lot of in marine invertebrates that we've been collecting, we are almost reaching 2,700 species on uh, marine invertebrates from the southern Gulf of Mexico, coral reefs, coastal areas, and sometimes some deep seas as well. So I posted that this webinar was going online and maybe some of our questions are more technical and are not uh, in the scope of this particular webinar. But we are looking or we are searching for some software where we can digitalize and follow and work and curate the information we already have. At the moment, we have prepared all our data uh, into the OBIS format, and we submitted those OBIS data from the collections, and they are uh, in this moment being revised by the geographic, uh, the Americas and Caribbean representant, which is some uh, lady in Venezuela, I'm not wrong. So uh, most of our questions is, okay, Arctus sounds great, but there are like four or five other softwares out there. And at least my, uh, the thing that keeps me from sleep at night is, are we going to select the right tool that the tool will continue in time? That um, is it like interconnected as uh, Phyllis was sharing with us I see that you already interoperate with the worms. Uh, you interoperate with some uh, geographical uh, geonames, whatever uh, based uh, software. So from my search in the past, I liked Arctus, but I'm not sure if this is the platform that we should go to. I have lots of technical questions and I would like to know if you have some spare time to uh, eventually have a more directed uh, webinar with us so we can clear all the technical questions we have. I think that that's 
all for now. Thank you. Thanks, Nuno. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you wouldn't mind dropping your email information in a private chat to me, I'd be happy to um, reach out to you. And uh, as a member of the Arctos Working Group, we'd be happy to um, have a, a web meeting with you and, um, and others regarding uh, Arctos as a fit for your data. So uh, happy to do that. Thanks. Any final questions before we wrap up? Again, that was really great, Anna and Phyllis. Um, yeah, I always learn so much during these and um, just wanted to mention too, when Phyllis was creating that media record, uh, that media did upload directly to the Texas Advanced Computing Center, TAC, where all of our media are stored. Um, so just to show you, that's where the, that URL came from. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and Looks like we are through with questions. So thanks for attending. Thanks to our presenters and we will see you in the fall. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thanks, Emily.